Hi, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to come and uh, listen to me talk about uh, high fidelity in a streaming world. I just had to, had to read that. Um, I've had the amazing privilege of being surrounded by music all of my life. Um, growing up, I'd visit my dad, George Martin, in the studios where he'd work. And I'd watch the meticulous nature of recording engineers, artists, and producers, the obsessiveness of trying to find the perfect sound. And after a while, I too became obsessed with sound and with music. And I had the fortunate opportunity about 10 years ago of um, taking my dad's work and the Beatles' work and creating this uh, immersive experience in Las Vegas of the Beatles' music. It was 7,000 speakers in a room, uh, which is still going there, going on today. And it's the first time in my life that I was enabled, able to control the, both the input of what, what went into the speakers and also what was coming out. And it got me thinking that after I've done, you know, I spent a lot of time doing recording and mixing and remastering, um, and the artist community has very little say in what, how the studio, how the music sounds once it leaves the studios. And uh, part of that is the reason why I took on this role of, uh, with an embarrassing title of sound experience leader at Sonos. Uh, normally when I say that, I put my hand across my face because it's, uh, it's, it's, something, it's something an English person would never come up with. But, uh, but I'm delighted to have that role. Um, and now many of you are familiar with the work um, of my dad, George Martin. He started Abbey Road in 1950. And in many ways, his career spanned the modern music industry. His first recordings, I'm clicking the button, there we are. His first recordings, um, and the first recordings of Abbey Road that he did were um, antiquated, to say the least. The most reliable source of electricity was gravity, and a man would uh, lift a weight up to the ceiling, and when the recording started, the producer would give the mark, the engineer would drop the weight, the weight would drop, the disc would spin, the disc would be engraved, and that's how the record was made when he first started making records. And the engineer's job, in order to see whether it was a good recording, was to look at the grooves on a disc to see if it was distorted. You couldn't play it back. And the reason why I say this is because it's kind of an interesting gap between the artist and the producer and the artist and the studios, because the, the artist wouldn't be able to hear his music in the studios, not until he heard it at home. That's the way recording was done. Then my dad forcibly signed the Beatles, or, you know, for both parties, um, and tape came along. Um, but in those days, the producer was still king. The artists were only allowed to hear their recordings if they were given permission. Um, but with tape, you could actually do playbacks of recordings. Um, my dad famously won the first Beatles session at Abbey Road with the Beatles. He actually asked them up to hear whether they liked the sound or if there's anything they didn't like. And George Harrison said to him, well, I don't like your tie for a start. The producer's goal this time it was to capture a live performance, capture a live set. There wasn't any thought about, you know, crazy ideas. It was really a, uh, to capture a photograph, a recording. That was, the, that was the North Star, I feel like, the drivers, to try and uh, uh, exactly replicate what was in the room. And the end result would be a monovile record that sounded good on radio, sounded good on AM radio. And fans would listen to this great music on antiquated players, which, sound, which would probably sound the same as answer phones do to us now, or dictaphones. Um, it, you, have to, you have to admit, actually, even that said, the records still sound fantastic today. Um, but there was a sea change. What happened was the North Star, that search for perfect real, real recordings, became a universe. Um, after the few, first few records, the Beatles explosion happened. Radio, there was radio saturation around the world. In the US, they had the top five places of the, of the top ten of the charts. And the whole world wanted to hear the Beatles, but the Beatles couldn't hear themselves. And so they quit touring, and they retreated back to Studio 2 to record. And they finally had, and this, this is the change, they finally had both the technology and the time to create music that had never been heard before. And capturing a live performance, a musical photograph, which I mentioned, had morphed into painting a landscape in sound. And this was Sgt. Pepper's. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band expressed, in that the Beatles expressed their creativity through a psychedelic world, a psychedelic landscape. They no longer made the music that represented themselves live. 
Um, but they made music that flowed into people's homes, that, that uh, take, took the listener to places they'd never been before. And the, with this, the feeling of listening to music in the home had changed forever. Um, speakers now painted pictures onto walls and new worlds could be opened up. Sounds previously never heard before could be created in the studios. And the, big, the artists themselves began to have a much larger part in how their record sounded. This, this breakthrough also changed the way people, the public started listening. Um, there was a demand for more clarity in audio in studios, but also in the home, and stereo happened. Um, you know, even though stereo, ha stereo recordings were made in the mid-60s, the people at home didn't have stereos until the late 60s, 70s. And with the dawn of stereo, there was imp improved amplifiers, speakers, and it meant album releases could be sensory experiences, you know, dark side of the moon, pieces of art that, you know, colored your walls with, with, with sensuous sound. And moving on, but then we move on. In 15, in 15 years' time, technology giants Sony and Philips announced a new medium that would fundamentally change the way we'd listen to music from then on, the compact disc. And we were no longer listening to music that was analog. It was, we were no longer listening to music that was carved in vinyl or on magnetic tape. Um, it was suddenly being converted to bits and then stored in a medium and then converted back into bits again to be played back in the home or played back wherever. And gone was, you know, scratchy vinyl and, 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 and tapes that warped, if you like. And there were shiny new discs that apparently would never break or snap. In fact, I'll just decide. When we, we got sent, as a family, we got sent the first compact disc player because of my dad's standing. And uh, I remember he got six discs and a compact disc player. And we went around to a friend's house for Sunday lunch. And he goes, this is the future of music. And he goes, and they're unbreakable. He tapped on his leg and it shattered. <laughs> but anyway. Um, but the dawn of digital music carried the exciting promise that anyone with talent or imagination could create music. All you need is ideas and a computer. Uh, gone were the days of, you know, $100,000 tape machines. This is actually a photograph that I took in Henson Studios a couple of years ago. It was kind of sad, the, the death of the tape machine. But it meant that musicians actually have gained much greater control over their sound. And the roles of both the producer and the artist um, have become more blurred. In reality, the idea of perfect clarity was distorted in the early days. The, um, the shape and sound of studio recording was dictated by digital codecs. Um, uh, as a result, music was cold under the harsh light of digital to begin with. Um, CDs, as I mentioned, scratched. But, you know, technology evolves and, you know, before long we're capturing sound with absolute clarity at unimaginable resolution. However, just when we got good at making CDs in the industry, just when CDs, you know, really started to sound great, people stopped buying them. Um, speakers disappeared from people's homes. The world of hi-fi or high fidelity disappeared for the masses. Um, and replacing it is really the world of convenience, um, portability, and of course, free music. But there's been a sea change in the last five years. Um, a new approach. Listening to music is is now as easy as switch on a light. You know, streaming has won the format war and we need to embrace the technology as much as we can. But here's the simple untarnished truth that everyone who creates music, you know, anyone who produces music in the studio wants the music to sound as great as possible when it's being played. And I've contemplated the advent and growth of streaming from behind the recording console and I've begun to realize that focusing my best efforts on just the front end, the listening experience, trying to get the best possible results in the studios, then sending them out the door is just only half of the job done. And, you know, I've been, been around for a while in the studios, and I've got friends like Paul Epworth and Spike Stent and Nigel Godrich. And we talk about this. We talk about how the fact that we spend hours, you know, driving people up the wall, making records, and then we realize that this is, you know, five years ago, that 90% of people would listen to them on, 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 on earbuds. And we never mix on headphones. But 
music is streaming, and I like to see it like sunlight shining through a window. It's our job to make sure that pane of glass is as clear as possible. You know, we need to let as much light through, and we need to fill your home with as much music as possible. And through this, I think we've entered a new age of, of high fidelity, a new beginning in which we, can, which, which we can appreciate all of the music on Earth. Gone are the days for us where we have to make a, make a recording and we have to check different print masters from CD factories, uh, vinyl factories. Today, there's no reason why the music you listen to at home shouldn't sound as mighty and as immersive, as impressive as it does for us in the studios. Simply put, the listeners should no longer have to sacrifice true high fidelity at the altar of convenience. Smart speaker systems linked to the internet once again are making the home the best possible place to discover, listen to, and share the songs and the artists we love. And at this time, music creators are finding new ways to, to, to be heard and build deeper, more connected relationships with the audience. It's a new stand that requires a different approach in, to curation and, prom and promotion, but one that will offer the artist an exponentially enhanced control of the way their music's experienced. These next 10 years will see amazing leaps in intelligent sound. Um, you know, I've been working on things in the last year which are kind of really interesting, which I'd love to tell you about, but I can't. As artists, uh, the artists are becoming more involved in harnessing the power of streaming and, and the way that music hits the home. The good old days weren't really all that good, and we should celebrate the fact that now every single brilliant, vibrant work is now right at our fingertips. Each speaker in our home is now a direct portal to the complete history of recording. And the future, the future will belong to those in the industry who can prove themselves capable of providing a, the most purest and the most seamless connection possible between the artist, their work, and their fans. To provide complete and perfect connection between the creation of sound, the heartbeat that goes into every note written, and the experience the listener has in their home. You know, we need to make sure that music is felt, absorbed, and celebrated. Uh, we need to make sure it's just, it's listened to and not just heard. And listened to in ways that resonate in our homes and make us feel good to be alive. And so I'd like to thank you uh, for listening and not just hearing me. So thank you very much for having me here. I've got one minute and 45 seconds for any questions. What about binaural recording? Binaural recording? Um, binaural recording is very good for headphones. Um, binaural recording, ladies and gentlemen, is where you have a, a, a microphone shaped like a head. And uh, my issue with that, funnily enough, it's great for very quiet music. The way that it's been tested and the way it's been shown, it's been around for a long time is when you have a matchbox going around someone's head, it's a bit like Dolby Atmos, it's very good. Our, our spatial awareness is much better at low levels than, it, than when people, things are played loudly. Um, I don't think it's great for speakers, and what I'm interested in is actually bringing, uh, I love the fact that people have started listening to speakers again, and high quality speakers again, and that music is shared, and then when people listen to music together, they have a different experience than when they listen to just on headphones, so that's, so, but I was great for headphones. 44 seconds, 43. The trap door's about to open. I'm about to disappear into a shark pool. <laughs> That's cool. Well, well, listen, thank you very much for having me.